All right, we're just gonna, I'm just gonna do a survey of the semester kind of briefly, and then if we bring up any questions, we'll address those, or if you have more specific questions, um, that your photosynthesis or the Krebs cycle, all those things that you cringe, okay, we'll be able to uh, address those. And certainly, if you don't have the question form today, and um, you think of something between now and Thursday, you can always contact me by email or uh, pop in my office. So if we look at where we've been uh, this semester, in the first unit, uh, the end of January into the beginning of February, we covered chapters one, two, and three. And this whole semester, we just worked three chapters at a time. Let's kind of keep it as precise as possible. And in the first chapter, we just defined what is biology. I mean, we talked about what constitutes something that is living. And then we moved on and looked at um, cell structures in the second chapter. Oh, no, 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 the second chapter was chemistry, everybody's favorite uh, chemistry chapter. And in the third chapter, we looked at cell structure, so we begin to apply some of those chemical uh, features. Um, in summary, in chapter one, we compared what's living and what's not, and we had this kind of concise list, and it's nice, and, and right, we already covered these, so I don't know if you need to, if you want to get the chapter one notes out, you can. But, um, we learned that living organisms right, are obviously comprised of cells, which we learned in chapter three, talking about the cell theory. So they're organized. We talked about in chapter three, they're membrane, eukaryotic versus prokaryotic. We learned that eukaryotic cells are much more organized, compartmentalized to organelles. We even went on to look at the function of the different organelles in chapter three. We noted some specialized organelles like the spore class, and uh, as you learned in lab, it's not just plants that have chloroplasts. You learn that some protists. Some bacteria also have, um, well, protists have chloroplasts, but uh, bacteria also have the ability to photosynthesize. They have the um, light reactive right, molecules in them. And so we learned that living organisms are organized. Unit two, you learned a whole heck of a lot about energetics. We talked about potential versus kinetic energy, right? And then we also looked at more chemical reactions and how energy is transformed from one form to another. We looked at catabolic versus anabolic reactions. Endergonic, exergonic reactions. We learned that energy is required for almost everything which a cell does to maintain life and homeostasis. In chapters Let's see, eight and nine, we talked about how life kind of begins for a cell, where it begins at cell division. We looked at the different types of cell reproduction, including mitotic cell division versus meiotic cell division. Uh, chapters uh, 12 and 13, I guess 11 and 12 maybe, we looked at evolution. We defined what it is, and we gave it a real technical definition for it. And we looked at the mechanisms for evolution as well. We definitely call, uh, talked a whole heck of a lot about DNA. We talked about its structure, its function. It traversed uh, chapter, excuse me, unit one and unit three. We really saw it kind of throughout the semester and we applied it in unit four where we're looking at these, these frequencies. So a whole heck of a lot about DNA. And then didn't really talk so much about how a cell actually responds to its environment, but we we're aware that cells are responsive to their environment because they have proteins in their membranes or proteins in their cytoplasm that allows them to respond to different molecules, um, carry out chemical reactions, et cetera, et cetera. And we can kind of elaborate on that for a good semester, how cells can be responsive to their environment. I pulled this up kind of as a template, but really that, that presentation that I gave way back in January unfolded the entire semester, right, where we were going for the whole semester. So, um, I, want it, I want this to be led by you guys, instead of me just purging more information to you guys, so I want to see what questions you have so that I can address them so you can perform better on the unit, or excuse me, on the final exam. So looking back where we've been, if you want to look at your handouts, worksheets, whatever,
Charles, that would be from chapter three, is that right? Let me see if I can find it. So what we're going to, the question was, can we review eukaryotic, eukaryotic cell organelles? And so that's what we're going to go over. Um, you have a static image from your textbook. This is a real generic cell. I mean, it doesn't have any form or anything like that. It's just plain. It, obviously, if it's, say, in your body, nerve cells that have a really cool long extension, muscle cells are also really long and thin. This depends on what type of organism you're looking at, whether it be a sea cucumber in the ocean floor or a cell in your brain, whatever, eukaryotic cells will have this, these same type of organelles. The proportion varies depending on the type of the cell, but the function is very similar in most cell types. Okay, so let's go through and look at a eukaryotic cell and its organelles. The first structure I want to talk about is this outer structure that's highlighted in yellow. What is this highlighted yellow thing? What is it called? What'd you say? You may have heard it, said it, I just couldn't hear it. Oh. What is this structure in the yellow? Thank you. All right, so that's a cell membrane. Okay. You call this cell membrane? Okay, you get out of biology, you know what the membrane is. Do what? The yellow. And it's labeled. <laughs> you can call it the cell membrane or you can call it the plasma membrane, but you should not call it the what? Cell wall. Okay. A cell wall is characteristic of plant tissue. Where our cell membrane is made up of what type of molecule? What kind of molecules make up a plasma or cell membrane? Primary, the bulk, the bulk of the membrane is a what? I am glad y'all are not taking the test today. <laughs> <laughs> What's the job of the membrane? Let's start there. What's the job of the membrane? Let things keep things in, keep things out, let things in, let things out. So it's regulatory. What's inside of a cell in general? Fluid. What's the main the bulk of the fluid is? Cytoplasm. It's called cytoplasm, but the greatest purport the molecule that's most in a fluid is the biggest solvent is water. water. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. The membrane keeps water inside of the cell and it keeps what? Outside? You can also keep water outside. So we have to have a water barrier. What could be a water barrier creating a membrane? A Lipids have a polar and a nonpolar region. What does that mean? Polar, nonpolar. Polar means what? 
Opposite what? Charges. Very good. So the polar part has opposite charges. So where did we apply that? What, why didn't you hear about the charge or something? It is due to the movement of electrons. And what does that influence, especially when we're looking at it in the membrane? Why do we care if something's polar or non-polar? You do care, right? <laughs> I hear your brain. <laughs> do I? The direction and keep on keep going. What it bonds with. What it bonds with. Light. So in summary, if you remember, our phospholipids have both polar and nonpolar regions. The polar parts are the charge parts, which means it can form what kind of bonds with water? Polar. The, mo the molecule itself is polar. There's a specific name. It is a um, not a covalent bond. That is a type of bond, so you're on the right track. What type of? Hydrogen? Yes, a hydrogen bond. Okay. It is a type of non-covalent bond. <laughs> so let's just review this. Our phospholipids make up our membranes and all of our organelles. They, are, they have a polar region. That's good because that can form hydrogen bonds with water. So the polar part is going to be the part facing either the extracellular fluid or the cytoplasm or the intracellular fluid. So if part of it's polar, the other part must be nonpolar. What part of the phospholipid is nonpolar? I need to enunciate even more. The, the lipid, thank you. The lipid part, the fat part, is nonpolar. It's not charged, it can't form what? Hydrogen bonds with water. So it creates a barrier, it creates a fat barrier, a lipid barrier. Which it'd be hydrophobic. The tails of the phospholipids would be hydrophobic. The heads are hydrophilic. Philic. Hydrophilic. And so our phospholipids make up our membranes. Is it only phospholipids in a membrane? What other kind of molecules might you find in a membrane? What other kind of molecules would you find in a membrane? Whether it be in the plasma membrane or around the <coughs> mitochondria, nucleus, whatever. What other kind of molecules are in these structures? Proteins, great. Proteins acting as transporters, or channels, or enzymes, what else? Sterols are other types of um, lipid-like molecules, okay, so like cholesterol, you heard of that? That's a membrane-bound sterol. So we got phospholipids, sterols, proteins. What else do we have in there? Glycoproteins. Glyco means what? Sugar. Okay, so proteins with sugars. You have fats with sugars. But our phospholipid bilayer is a conglomerate of phospholipids and proteins and sugars and sterols, and it's just a mixture. The ratio of those depends on the cell type. So, for example, do you remember we concluded our genetic study with looking at the, um, the blood cell type? Talk about the proteins expressed, whether someone's type has the type A or type B or none of those proteins expressed. That'd be an example. So not that your brain cells wouldn't express those proteins, but your red blood cells do. Okay, so it just depends on the tissue and the organism, the type of proteins and lipids and sterols that would be in the, a specific cell type. So a phospholipid bilayer makes up not only the plasma membrane, the whole cell membrane, it also compartmentalizes our different organelles. 
So the same thing, right, fossil lipid bilayer around the mitochondria, chloroplasts, whatever, you name it, it's going to have the same type of uh, amphipathic or po polar and nonpolar region. So let's look at our other organelles besides just the membrane. The next organelle, let's highlight, let me try to draw right here, and this little guy right here, can you see where I'm highlighting? That is a mitochondria. What is the job of the mitochondria? Chapter ATP synthesis. That's what it does. Mitochondria makes ATP. From chapter six, what are some important major reactions that occur in the mitochondria to make ATP. What were the two reactions in the mitochondria? The, the processes include the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. But they certainly produce a lot of these molecules called NADH and some what? What's another molecule a lot like it? NADH and? NADP is made in the um, uh, chloroplast, FADH, two, very good, but good. Makes those molecules, but also, what does our mitochondria use to make ATP? What does it consume that we need to use? Oxygen. Oxygen, very good. This is where oxygen, oxygen is used, right? The reason you breathe every moment is because your mitochondria needs the oxygen to serve as electron acceptors. What's it doing? What's the name of the structure embedded in the inner membrane of the mitochondria that makes ATP following the electron transport chain? The fluid is called the matrix, so the ATP would be pumped out into there, if you will. But the structure that makes it is called ATP synthase. It synthesizes ATP. It rotates, yes. Part of it does rotate. What other organelle will you find ATP synthase? You won't see it here in this image. Uh, DNA is a macromolecule, so it wouldn't be an organelle. It wouldn't be functioning in the DNA, but it would be coded for in the DNA. Okay, but it wouldn't be a working, built protein in the DNA. Okay, so which organelle would express ATP synthase? Besides the mitochondria, Organelle not shown here. What notable organelle would not be found in most animal tissues? Chloroplasts. Do you remember we saw ATP synthase in the chloroplasts, the thylakoid membrane? Yes, yes, I do remember. Yes, yes, yes. So, so the mitochondria. It's not just one membrane, it's actually two membranes, making up this whole structure. And its primary job is to make ATP. The bulk of the ATP actually comes from the electron transport chain. The Krebs cycle, if you remember, just kind of sets up the process. It makes NADH and FADH2 so that we can use those during the electron transport chain. What questions at this point do you have about mitochondria function? Right, what organelle do you want to talk about next? You want to talk about photosynthesis? All right, so let's go to the uh, chloroplast. And I'm trying to highlight it here, color or not, the purple thing that I'm trying to highlight. Chloroplast. The chloroplast is also a structure that has more than one membrane around it. It has an outer membrane, an inner membrane, 
And then a whole other set of membranes inside of it called what? What are the inner, innermost membranes called? These little discs. Thylakoids. Okay. And those thylakoids can stack to form individual process. It's pretty much very well regulated. What does a chloroplast need to make sugar? Light? What else? Inner, that would be the energy, okay, as well as in what other forms? So well, let's just elaborate then. Light energy, what other type of energy is necessary for photosynthesis? Water is used for our source of electrons. Very good. So we need light, water, which gives us electrons. Carbon dioxide is used in the light independent reaction. Very good. Why is carbon dioxide needed? Carbon dioxide bring to the party? Carbon. Because our sugar molecules need six carbon atoms. So carbon dioxide, gaseous carbon dioxide from the atmosphere is used, it's fixed, so it's said fixed or added to another five carbon molecule. So we're making six carbon molecule like glucose, the other energy gets first. The light, there's the light dependent reaction the Calvin cycle. Does the Calvin cycle need directly light energy? It doesn't use light energy. Only the light reaction use light energy. What did we learn about the light reaction? It's actually subdivided into how many processes? Two. We call them photosystem one and two, but we got hung up because we said two happens first. That's where the light is utilized to strip ox uh, water of its of electrons. It releases which gas? Photosystem two releases oxygen. H two O split. Oxygen goes out. What keep? What stays in the in the core? How do we make the ATP? I split H2O, the O goes out, the hydrogen ions stay, okay? And it's those hydrogen ions that are used by which structure to make ATP? ATP synthase. I thought I got that one. I know that one. <laughs> so just to recap, photosystem two, we learned, utilizes light energy to split water, take its electrons, keep the hydrogen ions, and release oxygen out into the atmosphere. Or maybe go into the neighboring, which organelle? Where can that oxygen be used? Mitochondria. So photosystem two made, makes for us hydrogen ions. And also what? Hydrogen ions are used to drive which structure we've been talking about? Very good. Hydrogen ions are used by ATP synthase to make ATP. Okay, so photosystem two makes ATP. We're not going to use it yet, though. The electrons then can be passed over to photosystem what? One. And photosystem one uses these electrons to make another energetic molecule called what? It's, it's using the electron transport chain. You're right. So the process is called the electron transport chain. What's the end molecule? NADPH. Very good. So photosystem one produces NADPH for the cell. So light reactions are just making ATP 
in NADPH. Those will be used where? In which process would NADPH and ATP be used? In the Calvin cycle. We need NADPH, ATP, and CO2. The Calvin cycle is going to use that ATP from photosystem 2. It's going to use NADPH from photosystem 1. Atmospheric carbon dioxide. And which enzyme? Anybody remember the name of the enzyme? Its name was this long when we truncated it. What a cute little name. Rubisco. Very good. Doing good. Next level. Where does this reaction occur? Where would the Calvin cycle occur? In the stroma of the, which organelle are we in? Chloroplast. And it makes six carbon molecules, it processes them. But the whole point is it's gonna make four to the cell what? What is, what is the car Calvin cycle making for the cell? Glucose and other carbohydrates. <laughs> All right. What, what is the glucose? <laughs> what is, why? Why does a cell need glucose? It is a sugar. Why does it need a sugar like glucose or any other like fructose? Like new energy. So the primary reason sugars are needed is for energy. However, if you remember, plants have an outer cell wall, which is also a type of what? Sugar. Okay, so we need it not only for metabolism, but structure as well. All right, so we've talked about the mitochondria. We've talked about the plasma membrane. Very briefly mentioned the molecule which makes up a cell wall, so it's polysaccharides or sugars. Um, what other organelle do you want to talk about? Let's go to the, a really important organelle, the nucleus. Okay? The nucleus, is this an entire structure? I'll try to draw an arrow. This whole inclusive structure <coughs> did a poor job of drawing on. Is a nucleus. It is also in a eukaryotic cell. It's going to be compartmentalized in a membrane. The nucleus, like our mitochondria, also has two membranes around it. But we don't want to completely offset the nucleus from everything else. So what is what structures the nucleus to make sure we can let substances like tRNAs out? or mRNA out, or ribosomal RNA out. What? Which structures of the nuclear membrane or the nuclear, nuclear envelope allow for the transport of molecules between the nucleus and the cytoplasm? Isn't that nuclear pores? Nuclear pores. They're called pores and they're on the nucleus. What's the big deal with the nucleus? It holds DNA. And you know so much more than that little simple chapter three introduction. You know a ton of information about DNA. You know where it's located. You know its basic structure. You know its functions. We talked about it in its role of transcription. What is transcription? It is, a, it is a first of a series of reactions. It reads, transcription utilizes DNA template because it does code for different what? Our DNA codes for different? Yeah. 
you could just say genes, right? Our DNA codes for different genes. Gene is a concise term for the protein that's going to be expressed in the cell. So which where you're going is based upon amino acid assembly. So inside of the nucleus, right, you know, yes, it holds the DNA, but you know so much more than that. And we know what the DNA does. It has the entire what for that organism? The entire genome. It has chromosomes. Depending on the cell type, the cell type may be diploid, because it's what type of cell? What type of cell would be diploid? Somatic cell or a body cell. Or the nucleus may be haploid if it's a what? Sex cell or gamete, sperm cell, egg cell, whatever. Okay. But it still has a nucleus, it still has DNA in it. In our somatic cells, we can control the regulation of our genes, which we now know may have different variations of alleles, depending on the heritage of that cell type. So we talked about examples of hair color, skin color, red blood cell type, etc. Those proteins, like ATP synthase or nuclear pores, right? I could just keep naming all the proteins that you might find in or on a cell, are coded for in the cell nucleus, so it's DNA. They're coded for specifically in the DNA. Even though they're coded, just because there's a code for something, does it guarantee that it's going to be expressed? If I want to express a protein, though, I first need to figure out which process first. Transcription. First transcription. First transcription. I'm just trying to read you. Um, transcription occurs in the cells what? In the nucleus. That's where the DNA is. There's no reason to take it out, possibly damage it, mutate it, whatever. Keep it in the nucleus. What does transcription make? Different types of RNA. What are the different types of RNA? Messenger or M, T or transfer RNA and R, which is ribosomal RNA. Transcription makes those different types of RNA molecules. Using some terms that we've used, make complementarily to the DNA code. Notably, though, our RNA molecules lack which nucleotide base? The RNA lacks which base? The T, the thymine. Yet, in its place, it has what type of uracil? Is the RNA the protein? No. What is the, what is the relationship between RNA and protein? What's the relationship between an RNA molecule and a protein molecule? Let's say, let's say, let me be more specific. What's the relationship between a, an mRNA molecule and a protein? Bring the message to the protein and tell what to do. You're on the right track. I'm just going to clarify some terms, though. The mRNA brings the genetic sequence, the complement sequence, so that we can make the protein. Okay. What it brings it to is the ribosome, which itself is a protein, but it's not the protein that it's coding for. So in other words, the mRNA is the link, the intermediate link between DNA and the protein being assembled. So if I want to make a protein, I need different types of RNA. What is the process where RNA translation? Translation encodes for, right? Translation is a process that utilizes the mRNA code to produce a protein. What is the 
it about mRNA that allows for the coding of a protein? Codon. The codon. Code for individual amino acids. So it just puts the amino acids in sequence, in the correct sequence, and as they form the little peptide bonds, a protein is assembled. Two locations, the translation may occur in two locations. Where are those two locations in which translation may occur? Cell location. The cytoplasm or cytoplasm or the rough ER, the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Which I'll try to highlight here. Dialing that up, but pink in the purple blob. The rough ER, if you remember early in the semester, we said is an organelle that helps manufacture protein. In other words, I could have started this, this semester with the rough ER allows for translation, but you guys would have panicked a lot because we started out the second unit with translation, okay? But translation can occur within the rough ER or it may occur where? In the cytoplasm. One more organ element I would like to just summarize is looking at your individual scores to kind of see how you're doing. What other organ would you like to talk about? Or what other biology topic would you like to talk about? No. <laughs> That's the philosophical easy bit. This is the. I'll probably have it quartered 25% each, each unit. Um, yes. Um, I believe I pulled down your grade bill. I can't remember if I did that or not. Um, I may have already reported your grade, so it won't impact your grade, but it should be available. Um, can you check for me and let me know? So I'm, I'm in class till three, so I may not remember to double check. But if you can check and let me know if it's still visible, that'd be great. But yeah, LearnSmart's a good passive way to study. We rely solely upon it, as you noted. There's some stuff in there that we didn't get to. I won't hold you accountable for, but it's a good way to. All right, so I'm going to conclude our presentation or discussion here. Um, I'll go into D2L. Your scores are on D2L, so you could just as easily look at them, but we'll look at them together and um, see how you're doing. Exam is on Thursday at 9.30. You'll be here on time. Make an A. I'll be happy. You'll be happy.